and they're off. It's a nice start for how about them apples going out to battle for the lead. Bali Dancer along the inside is matching strides through the opening furlong. And she's got away as up close to in the blue silks on the outside. Real Fire is fourth, the length and a half off the lead. Then Abayadir racing on the inside of Dendera. Ice Queen at the back of a very compact field. It's Bali Dancer to the half mile pole, pressed by How About Dem Apples, who's a neck back second. She's got away on the outside third. Then Real Fire, Abayadir tucked in fifth, but only three off the lead, followed by Dendera and Ice Queen. Bali Dancer takes them around the far turn. How about them apples right up alongside once again? And how about them apples takes the lead? She's got away, cruising up three wide. Abayadir, just a waiting room in the red. We'll switch to the outside for the drive. Abayadir gets a clear shot now and is coming swiftly. They're a furlong for the finish. Also bottled up is Ice Queen. Abayadir on the outside coming at She's Got Away. On the inside, how about them apples? Abayadir with good momentum takes the lead close to home. And it's going to be Abayadir, a convincing win by a length and a half. How about them apples? She's Got Away, Ice Queen and Dendera. And they're off. Smooth start. It's all right. Hustled on the outside. Here's Blursday now up to take the lead. Joined by Spoiled Rotten. These two are now 1-2 onto the main track. Back on the street. Races in third. Followed by Run For My Honey. Fourth and about three off the lead between rivals. Parko in the white moving up at the rail. And it's all right. Now trails. Blur's day to the half mile pole, leading the way just under a length to spoiled rotten Luna tight, tad tight on the inside. Then it's back on the street in the clear, moving up to take second once again. And run for my honey is in between horses for three off the lead. It's all right, hard ridden outside of them. And at the back of the field comes Parco. Blur's day doing it easily thus far, has it by a length over back on the street, coming to the quarter pole. Then Spoiled Rotten, Run For My Honey, caught four wide, but in the thick of it, another three back to Parco. They're at the top of the stretch. Blur's Day with company now. Back on the street is up alongside. Spoiled Rotten in between them, running a gallant race. And Spoiled Rotten are in head and head with Back on the Street for the wire. Spoiled Rotten or Back on the Street. Spoiled Rotten has something left and pulls away. Armando Aguilar and Spoiled Rotten to win it by two. Back on the street second. Parco picked it up nicely late third. Run for my honey fourth. Oh. We're in the gate. And they're off. Wizard of Westwood, a little bobble out of the gate, recovers quickly and sprints right up to take the lead. Malibu Coast comes away in second, game time third, and Escape Artist is fourth, three lengths off the leader. Mi Hermano Ramon is allowed to relax in the early stages, five off the pace, and eastbound right next to him. They've taken even closer order with a lap to go, and Wizard of Westwood is the leader. Malibu Coast is second. Then game time, escape artist far outside. Even wider goes eastbound, forced to go about four wide into the first turn. And me, hermano Ramon, comfortable inside of him. They move around the clubhouse turn with Wizard of Westwood, the boss. It's Malibu Coast, a length and a half back second. And on the outside of them, it's escape artist third. Game time tucked in neatly fourth. Me, hermano Ramon, four off the pace, eastbound outside of him. Wizard of Westwood takes him to the half mile pole. Malibu Coast running along in second. Escape Artist third. The McCarthy Runners one, two, three with game time down at the rail. Then comes me, Hermano Ramon. He'll need to find racing room. Three off the pace. And outside of him is eastbound. 
Wizard of Westwood maintains the lead of a length and a half. Game time poised when he finds room. Malibu Coast between horses, escape artist. Now me, Hermano Ramon gets underway. Two and a half or three off the lead. He'll come on the far outside. They turn for home. Malibu Coast up to Wizard of Westwood. Game time down on the inside. Me, Hermano Ramon, storming down the center of the course. And he's coming swiftly. Me, Hermano Ramon, trying to get to Wizard of Westwood. Wizard of Westwood. Me, Hermano Ramon. Wizard of Westwood. Me, Hermano Ramon. Me, Hermano Ramon. Got him at the wire. Perfectly timed by Reese Bully. Wizard of Westwood ran his eyeballs out and lost a heartbreaker in the Singletary. Race four is coming up next, 23 minutes to post, Bell. You're in the gate. And they're off. Teen Drama flew out of the gate. Careless Star has good speed, too, and they're joined by Kiss My Cat. And Kiss My Cat up to take the lead. Careless Star now second, a half length behind. It's three more to Teen Drama, racing on the inside of Never Sway. Trojan Way didn't have the best of beginnings. Is seven off the leader, followed by Big Bell and Roses are blue. It's Kiss My Cat into the far turn in hand, leading three quarters of a length to Careless Star in second. Three more to Teen Drama down at the rail, making a little bit of headway. Third, Never Sway in fourth. Then Trojan Wave, Big Bell inches up on the outside, and Roses are blue. Kiss my cat with a quarter of a mile to go. Careless Star tries to press once again in second. Then Never Sway outside Teen Drama, Big Bell, Trojan Way, top of the stretch. Kiss my cat shakes loose. It's a three-length lead with a furlong to finish the job. Careless Star could not keep pace in second. Never Sway, Teen Drama moving up, third and fourth. Kiss My Cat, three-length lead. Never Sway trying hard to close the gap late. Kiss My Cat, kiss my cat all the way. Never Sway was second. Teen Drama finished third, then Big Bell. You're in the gate. And they're off. Teen Drama flew out of the gate. Careless Star has good speed, too, and they're joined by Kiss My Cat. And Kiss My Cat up to take the lead. Careless Star now second, a half length behind. It's three more to Teen Drama, racing on the inside of Never Sway. Trojan Way didn't have the best of beginnings. Is seven off the leader, followed by Big Bell and Roses are blue. It's Kiss My Cat into the far turn in hand, leading three quarters of a length to Careless Star in second. Three more to Teen Drama down at the rail, making a little bit of headway third, Never Sway in fourth. Then Trojan Wave, Big Bell inches up on the outside and roses are blue. Kiss My Cat with a quarter of a mile to go. Careless Star tries to press once again in second. Then Never Sway outside Teen Drama, Big Bell, Trojan Way, top of the stretch. Kiss My Cat shakes loose. It's a three-length lead with a furlong to finish the job. Careless Star cannot keep pace in second. Never Sway, Teen Drama moving up, third and fourth. Kiss My Cat, three-length lead. Never Sway trying hard to close the gap late. Kiss My Cat, kiss my cat all the way. Never Sway was second. Teen Drama finished third, then Big Bell. Tropical Terror going in. The last one will be Bletchley Park. And they're off. Very even start. Balladeer and Anne Hall. Anne Hall a little bit quicker. 
at the rails. Silver Surfer comes away in third, subsidized fourth, followed by Tropical Terror, Reckless Spirit, Bletchley Park, and Colinga Road is at the back. Anmer Hall ensures an honest tempo with Balladeer three quarters of a length back in second. Then Silver Surfer on the inside third, followed by subsidized still fourth, three lengths off the pace. Tropical Terror races next, a length and a half clear of Bletchley Park. The two trailers, Reckless Spirit at the rail, and two more to Colinga Road. Down the back stretch, Anmer Hall, a length and a half to Balladeer heading to the half mile pole, with Silver Surfer along the rail in third, followed by Subsidize in the Pink Silks fourth, three lengths off the lead. Tropical Terror, Bletchley Park. Reckless Spirit looking for some racing room, moving up between them, but still in traffic. Had to hit the brakes just now. And two more back to Colinga Road. It's Anmer Hall, Balladeer, 1-2, Silver Surfer awaiting some room. Subsidized, moves up three wide. Behind them, Reckless Spirit now gets underway, and the white blinkers will come on the far outside. Four wide turning for home, but Reckless Spirit has momentum. Colinga Road following him. They're a furlong from the finish. Anmer Hall, Balladeer still head and head. Center of the course, subsidized Reckless Spirit. Outside of them is Colinga Road, and in the meantime, Silver Surfer shot through, and Silver Surfer with a dream trip silver surfer got there that was very nice handling from hector berrios an oncoming reckless spirit balladeer was in between them in that photo And they're off. It's a fast start for Tom Horn. Bailey's budget very quick as well, up to take the lead. Cowboy Mike came away in the top flight, followed by Devil Be Me down at the rail. Devil Be Me now takes third. Big Baby in the yellow colors is down on the inside, about five lengths off the lead. Then Never Not Once, racing in mid-pack, too clear of Daddy's Quest. It's a gap of three to Imperial Hornet, who races on the extreme outside. Andy, can you hear me, is trying to make some headway. They're followed by Carol's Comic, racing a length clear of My Ransom, and slow starting Big Bet Jaffin Safa is at the back of the field. Rounding the far turn, it's Bailey's Budget dueling with Tom Horn, tracked intently by Devil By Me, who moves up nicely into third. Just behind them, Andy, can you hear me, is looking for room, has some run. Cowboy Mike is next at the top of the stretch. Andy, can you hear me, begging for a way through. And Big Bet Jaff and Sama blocked and coming smartly. In the meantime, Devil Be Me has opened up too. Andy, can you hear me, has a clear shot on the inside. These are the two, and it's Devil Be Me. Devil be me in a stellar comeback, wins convincingly. Andy, can you hear me second? Big bet Jaffin Safa was a promising third, then Cowboy Mike and Carol's comic. Respect the code. In the gate. And they're off. Respect the code. Fast buck, both out very alertly. And in between them, Mucho Del Oro is up and on the pace, too. Harbored Memories in the orange colors is one from the rail. Don't Swear Dave is on the fence, just about a half length off the leader. Respect the code now settles behind this group. Racing in fifth, just in front of one flew south, two clear of standing O. The two trailers are Samburo and Desmond Doss at the back of the field. It's fast buck into the far turn, pressed by Don't Swear Dave, and harbored memories of threatening third on the outside of them. Down on the rail comes Standing O, taking a joint fourth spot with Mucho Del Oro just outside of him. One flew south in that group, wider than both of them. Dropping out of it is Respect to Code and looking for room Sam Burrow. Then Desmond Doster at the top of the stretch. Fast Buck keeps on rolling. Opens up three, in fact. 
One flew south in the center, standing O at the rail, and in between them, Harvard Memories past the 16th pole, fast buck, two and a half length lead, standing O closing, but running out of time, it's going to be fast buck. Fast buck and Diego Herrera defeating standing O. Then it was a photo, Harvard Memories, and an oncoming Desmond Dawson was a scramble for fifth. Chin. Post time in 22 minutes. To complete the line. And they're off. Escape route was out very quickly. Divine Armor showing some early speed on the extreme outside. Kingdom Heart is in the mix through the early stages, as is Disco Ball, who's vying for the lead right now. And so it's Disco Ball and Kingdom Heart head and head for the front. Escape route just a half length back in hand third. Divine Armor races in fourth. Murray fifth, four lengths off the lead, followed by Lovesick Blues and Kahuna Magic. It's Disco Ball heading into the far turn, leading by a length. Kingdom Heart on the outside second, followed by Escape Route in third. Then comes Divine Armor and a little bit of traffic at this stage. Love Sick Blues has a clear shot on the outside. Murray is next, four lengths to make up, and another three back to Kahuna Magic. They're getting tightly bunched coming to the quarter pole. Disco Ball and Kingdom Heart are even terms now. They're joined by Love Sick Blues on the outside. Escape Route is next. Behind them comes Divine Armor. Murray on the far outside. There's an eighth to go. And Love Sick Blues takes off for the wire. Opens up three in a hurry. Now Divine Armor starts to kick in, taking second. Disco Ball third. Murray still far back. It's Love Sick Blues by two. Love Sick Blues, a riding triple for Umberto Rispoli. Divine Armor, a good second. The escape route was third, followed by Disco Ball and Murray. No scratches or jockey changes. Golden Hour double kicks off in 25 minutes. Joe Dandy to the outside. Bring in. And they're off. 34 Coop is hustled out for early speed. So I'm told up close in the early going. And Goldeneye comes through. So it's Goldeneye and 34 Coop to battle it out through the opening furlong. So I'm told now third. And Circle of Champion might have clipped heels there and lost the rider going into the first turn. So it's Goldeneye, the leader, by about a half a length. 34 Coop is in second. They're followed by So I'm Told and Circle of Champions. At the rail, it's Talis. 911 Turbo is next. The gap of three back to Frost Alert. Derecho Dandy second to last. And Numero D's at the back of the field. Abdul Alsagur has walked off the turf course under his own power. They move into the far turn, and it's Goldeneye on the inside, leading by a head. 34 Coop has been pressing him throughout, so I'm told, waiting for room on the inside. And outside of him, circle of champions in the red colors. 9-11 turbo, four lengths off the lead. Talis on the inside is in striking range, and there's Derecho Dandy, yellow, coming wide on the far outside, wide open as they turn for home. And now So I'm Told is cut loose on the outside, and so is 9-11 Turbo. 9-11 Turbo traveling sweetly up to battle with So I'm Told. 9-11 Turbo takes the lead. Talis is on the inside third, then Derecho Dandy. It's 9-11 Turbo. 9-11 Turbo wins it by two. Second went to So I'm Told, then it was Talis in third, followed by Derecho Dandy, and Frost Alert completes the super high five.
Hi, everybody, and welcome to San Anita, another three-day weekend of racing here at the Great Race Place. Delighted that you decided to join us. My name is Tom Quigley, VIP player, concierge, also your seminar host for the next 38 minutes or so. Did you take a look at today's card? There's eight races, of course. Five of them are maiden races. Now, a lot of people don't like to handicap maiden races, but other people do. It depends upon whether or not you kind of get intimidated by first-time starters and things of that nature. But our guest today, if you look him up on Twitter, he's known as the California Maiden Man. His name, John Bowl. John, welcome to the seminar. Happy Friday. Hey, good to see you, Tom. It's great to see you as well. Now, before we talk about your propensity and the love for maiden races, let's first talk about how you got involved in the sport of horse racing. It's an interesting story because you were more or less like a softball player. And of course, there's a few parks surrounding uh, San Diego Park here in Arcadia, California. So you decided to play baseball one night in a league and lo and behold, look what happened. How'd you get introduced to this great game of ours? Well, you're partially right. Um, <laughs> there's a baseball field behind Santa Anita over here and we, it was a hardball, men's league. It was my sixth year, summer of 86. What position did you play? First base, stretching out for T those. Tall guy, I like yep, it. All yep. right. And one day uh, in the summer of 86, our second baseman, Louis, Louis Gomez from Montebello, uh, knew Jimmy the Hat. And we all know Jimmy the Hat. He's a yeah. racetrack character. And uh, Louis said, let's go to the races. Uh, the game's over. We won. Let's go over to Santa Anita. You'd never been before. Never been. In our uniforms, <laughs> Alhambra A's, that was our team. And we walked over. Did uh, you win the game that night? Do you remember? We won the game, okay. yes. And we walked over. Louis introduced me to Jimmy. Jimmy told us a couple hot picks that, that day. <laughs> and lo and behold, we won. So you and, were hooked. Well, it was, it was instant. You know, I was kind of a struggling rider at the time. And, uh, and, here we are today. You were like, where was this place all my life? <laughs> Easy know. money, right? Little did you know that those two winners would cost you a lot of money basically 40 years later. <laughs> You're so right. <laughs> 30, now, 37 years later, I can add it up and I'll tell you later. <laughs> now, in that baseball league, it wasn't just a bunch of neighborhood guys playing. Tell us about some of the alumni that played in that particular baseball league that weren't horse racing related. Well, we had a pitcher named Steve, uh, and Steve was let go by the Red Sox because he had an attitude problem. And he was often, when he didn't like a pitch or call from an umpire behind the plate, he'd roll the ball back to the umpire. Roll he had it. an anger management he, issue. Yes, he did. I got gotcha. you. And they let him go, so he joined us because he still loved the game, and we rode his arm I to, bet, I to bet. the L.A. County Championship. He was unstoppable, wasn't he? He was. And um, Now, he I, heard, I heard rumors that Fernando Valenzuela might have participated in that league. Is that true? That's what we were told. We never really faced him, but we faced some other guys who were – let go by other teams. So it was a very competitive league, uh, 36 teams, and we were the best in the summer of 86. So you come to the racetrack in 1986, you fall in love with it because of Jimmy the Hat, and obviously now you're kind of obsessed with handicapping maiden races. What is it about maiden races that you find so compelling? Well, what happened was I started listening to the radio, and at that time, Steve Arthur had a show sure. with Roger Stein and Jerry Antonucci yep. five days a week. Some original gangsters in that lineup. <laughs> yes. Some OGs. And they would make their picks or they had someone would call in and make their picks. And basically it was the same information that's in the racing form. And I was looking for something beyond that. You were to, looking for an edge. An edge, a hook, something that would steer me to a horse that was going to win. But it was always the same information. So there was no breakage of new content. So... I dug into Maidens because they were the hardest on the on the card. Now, when you said you dug into Maidens, you've actually been a publisher of many books about Maidens. We're displaying one on the set right now. If we can get a close-up of it, the current book that you've published is, is called Seven Furlong Sire Rankings, Cracking the Code for Maidens that Run Between Seven to Seven and a Half Races. It's obviously a voluminous type of book where you've basically looked at every single sire that has sired a runner that's run at those particular distances. Tell us maybe what one or two nuggets you found as a result of the research for that that book well the one of the drivers of the book was that you always would hear somebody handicap on tv or radio and they'd say well it's a seven furlong race the horse ran fast at a mile and now he's shortening up and that's my pick and i thought it doesn't always work that way you wanted solid evidence to I prove wanted, that i wanted proof i wanted proof so what i started doing is i started logging in 2011 so that was, what, 12 years ago? Yeah, time and flies. Time flies. 12 years ago, all the winners, the sires of the winners of seven furlong races. And lo and behold, um, some nuggets did come out. Spikestown is number one. 
uh, surpassed Tap It two years ago. And Into Mischief is number three. Um, and the fastest riser of any sire right now. Now, will they be automatic plays if they if if, no. if they're they're not? Okay. Absolutely. And we'll tell us what some of, t- quickly. Why don't you tell us maybe what one of the other criteria would be before you'd actually major, make a wager on a son of Spites Town riding seven furlongs in a maiden race? Um, I want to see speed because you have to have sustainable speed. And the seventh race today is a seven furlong race. So we can get into it in more detail on that race. We sure will. But before we take a break for Frank Miramati, a couple more questions for you, John. You talked about how you were a writer. And of course, one of your professions, you were just, let's face it, a weekend warrior here at the track. You didn't, you were not a professional, but you did spend a lot of time working for the Ad Council, which I find very interesting. Tell us what you did for the Ad Council. Well, I was the managing director here in the West and covered all um, TV, radio, outdoor, uh, print, magazine, west of the Mississippi. And what were some of the PSA promotions that you would be promoting through the Ad Council? We would go, I would, I would go to the TV stations with betas back then. (laughs) I remember those. and, And, or cassettes and encourage them to run Smokey Bear or Buzz Driving is Drunk Driving or Buckle Up or or um, wildfire prevention with with Smokey, of course, and try to get them on the air because they would run on donated airtime. And so you had to make nice with with the public affairs director at the TV radio. And then towards the end, they wanted me to cover New York from Burbank. And I said, okay, we'll do it for a year. And then sayonara. Now that's a tough sell. How often did they say no to you? And how often did they slam the door in your face since you were asking something for free? Um. Interesting you should ask that, because in the beginning, I was a California guy going to New Mexico and Texas, and it was very challenging because there are differences, culturally speaking, but over time, you'd show up on time and be at their door, and they'd start airing them, and you'd ask for you know special privileges to get them on the air, and they would because they had an issue with domestic violence prevention or or they had drunk driving problems in Dallas or wherever, and they would say, yeah, we'll get this on the air for you. We're talking to John Bull. You can tell that he has done the research in order to research what maidens might perform more effectively at different distances. It's been a labor of love for almost the last 40 years. Because there's five maiden races on today's eight race card, he's the perfect uh, utility to bring in and basically find out who he likes in all those main races. But before we find out who John likes in any of those races, let's toss the microphone over to track announcer Frank Miramani and get the early changes, which are minimal, on today's card here at the Great Race Place. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Santa Anita Park. The track is fast, the turf firm, the rail on the turf at 30 feet. Here are the changes. The first is the start of the 50 cent early pick five. Number one, Adventuresome, will carry two pounds over. Scratch number eight, Maltese Falcon. Number eight, Maltese Falcon is out. We do have a super high five carryover from last week. $11,963. In race two, we have a blinker note. Overweights in the third, number one plus two, number two plus three, and number five plus three. The rainbow six starts with the third today. There's $58,000 in the jackpot carryover. Turning to the fourth. No changes. Fifth race, numbers one and two, each carry three pounds over. In the sixth, there's no high five wagering with the scratch of number four, Montana. Number three, silver and black, carries two pounds over. Golden hour double, golden hour pick four, will start in the seventh race. Blinker note, golden hour double starts in the eighth. Number two, turquoise bikini. Three pounds over. Those are the early changes on today's card. Enjoy your day at Santa Anita Park. 
Let's go back to Quigley's Corner. His special guest today is the California Maiden Man, John Bull. Welcome back. We're talking horses with John Bull. He is the California maiden man, that's for sure. And he uh, basically analyzes maiden races historically to try and identify which sires are more prolific at different distances. Here's a copy of his latest book, Analyzing Sires, that uh, basically have runners running at seven furlongs. To give you an idea of the amount of research that John has done, he's looked at the results of over 10,000 races over the last 10 years, and he's come up with a pecking order of 433 most prolific sires that uh, have runners either at seven furlongs or seven and a half furlongs, both on the dirt and turf. We'll talk about this book a little bit later. If you're watching and listening and you want to get a free copy of the book, we're going to be able to do that if you're quick with your fingers on Twitter. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But, John, as I mentioned, we've got five uh, maiden races on today's card, including race number one. So let's take a look at race number one, which, as you heard Frank Miramati say, uh, has a super high five carryover of $11,000 and also begins the 50-cent early pick five. There is one scratch. Scratch the eight, Maltese Falcon, leaves us with a field of and this race, this race is for maiden special weights going one mile on the turf course. The rails today are at 30 feet. The original morning line favorite was number three, classically at three to one. But the one taking the action at the moment is on the bottom, number nine, Precision Strike, two to one on the tote board. Give us your handicapping thoughts, if you would, on race one, John. Great, Tom. Thank you. Um, just a couple pr preliminary um, philosophy reason, uh, ways I approach the races. So I want to find out who's the fastest horse in the race. Uh, who's the Connor McDavid? Who's the fastest skater? Who's the fastest horse? So the Connor McDavid, McDavid for those of hockey fans out there, Edmonton the, Oilers. Thank you. He's the fastest skater in the world. So He's the Wayne Gretzky of the current era. Amen. And we want to find who the Connor McDavid, McDavid is in each race, irregardless of the sires. You don't care at this point in your in your right. handicapping, irregardless right. of the sires. Who's, who's the fastest horse? That's our winner. Is right. The, the That's kind of the horse. name of the game, isn't it? And. And the way I break it down is the horse is 70% of the equation, 15% with the trainer, and 15% with the jockey. So in the first race, watching uh, the, the, re, uh, pre, uh, the replays, um, I really like the way Upright turned it around in his last race and really turned it on, was very aggressive, very up on the bridle, and ideally he'll be first or second and then we'll pull away in the stretch and then B, the second horse will be classically with um, uh, Hernandez up for Diamato and you can't you have to look at every Diamato on the turf now precision strike we know is a favorite but in his last three races there have been no winners out of the races he's run and it was only six horses in the last race and he kind of just went around the track. So plus with a 30 foot rail, with the rails out 30 feet, he's gonna to have to really expend himself to get over. So I like five and one and three. John, a skeptic would say number five upright is moving up in class from the maiden claiming rank into the maiden special weight. Does that concern you at all from a handicapping standpoint or does it not matter wherever Connor McDavid might skate? <laughs> really, it doesn't matter from a class standpoint. It was the speed. The speed of the he was the speed, and he really held his speed the whole time around. And he, you know, it, it's if he can get up there first or second, then I, I like him all the way around. Five and three in race number one. One more question before we take a look at race number two, John. The sires in race number one, from a turf standpoint, are there any prolific sires in here that you know of that maybe you would give an extra nod to? Well, Spitestown is a favorite sire of mine, but. I, I just don't see this horse winning at first asking on Which the turf. Which would be number six, number Caribbean six, King. Car Caribbean King, I'm sorry. Um, and uh, Neshoba's Joy, this is a seventh race for Neshoba's Joy, so and it's been fourth four times, so there's not much. I don't see any improvement there. So. You make a very good point, John, that I want to visit for a minute. Although the horse might be bred for turf, at some point after a number of efforts, you have to say, okay, the breeding for turf or seven furlongs or whatever the breeding might be doesn't really apply anymore because the horse has proven that he really has very little ability. Well, you look for excuses, and can you minimize the excuses and give it another chance? But four times being fourth, I don't know. 
five and three in race number one. That's what John Bowl, our seminar guest, does know. Race number two, John, we're sprinting five and a half furlongs in the main track. Also, race two begins the 50 cent early pick four. This race is for $12,500 claimers. We've got a field of six, number three established, who we haven't seen since late February. Is the six to five morning line favorite. Give us your thoughts on race two. I love these races. 12 five claimers. These are the blue collar workers of the of the of the racetrack. And now I know the favorites established first off the claim, but dropping off a claim that I don't like at all. Um, so I'm not going to use uh, established. So I went to the first pick would be scratchy Apache. Now, now I've had in years past, I've had problems on horses that come from Los Al over to Santa Anita. I think a lot of handicappers have. Well, I've tried to really break it down here a little bit. So a thousand, these are a thousand yard races. This horse Scratchy's coming out of, and competitive in these races. And five and a half furlongs is 1,210 yards. So it's 210 yards longer than a thousand yards. So, and then if you go back to September 17th last year for Scratchy, he wins at five and a half by two lengths and three horses come out of that race and win their next race. So, and then, and there was a horse here recently called One Flew South who did three preps over at Low Sal and one with Dorsormo down the hill. That was a Bruce Headley horse. A, Gus Headley. Gus Headley, I'm sorry. Yes. And so I'm trying to get a bead on these horses that are coming over from Los Al because we're probably going to see more and more of it. So A is Scratchy Apache, and then B would be Mighty Matt. And Mighty Matt, if you go back to December this year, last year, also won at five and a half, and two horses came out of that race who won their next race. Plus, there's a, a really nice bullet of 47 flat, best out of 77, coming into this race. Eight to one on top in race number two. John's top pick number four, Scratchy Apache. Let's turn the page, take a look at race number three on today's eight race card. This begins the 20 cent rainbow pick six, the jackpot single ticket carryover, now up to $58,000. That amount plus whatever is wagered today will be yours if you're the only winning ticket. And we kick things off here. This is the first open baby race for maiden special weight two year olds the previous uh, four and a half furlong races were for calbreds this race is for open company we've got a field of five including the morning line favorite who's a filly running against the boys number five she's my niece who's eight to five on the morning line now before we get your thoughts on the race john because all of these are first time starters and of course we'll talk about pedigree let's first look at workouts for three of the five and we'll go in post position number order the first workout we're going to watch back on april 20th is for number three smoke them easy and smoke them easy worked five furlongs, which will be farther than today's distance, courtesy of our friends at XBTV.com. Let's watch Smoke Em Easy break from the inside, and you can see he gets off slow. And Smoke Em, for, from a first-time starter standpoint, according to our friends at DRF Formulator, is 0 for 15 with first-time starters. This is a Calbred running against open, and the workmate here is Buck Owens. Buck Owens on the outside is also from the Steve Miotti barn. His most recent effort back on April 28th here at San Anita, he finished fourth in a major Maiden twenty thousand dollar claiming race. Now, granted, Buck, o Buck Owens is older than a two year old, so Smoke Em Easy, you can see on this workout down on the inside, recovered from that slow break and is going nice and easy in hand here. The workout time won't literally uh, take anybody's breath away, but one oh two, you can see he's doing it relatively easily. Buck Owens continues to basically outwork him, and uh, I should also mention that Easy Indy, the dam of Smoke Em Easy, is two for four with first time starters. Nothing of note, but there is some precocity here, at least on the dam side. So that's the workout basically for number three. Smoke em easy, doesn't take your breath away, but very workmanlike, particularly for a first time starter. The next workout we're going to watch is for number four, Mr. Chivas, a daughter of Stay Thirsty, breaking from the outside here in this team drill of three. And the most important thing to take note of is A, look how small Mr. Chivas is outside of going mobile. But if you've been paying attention, going mobile was a very impressive first time starter winner, debut winner back on April 30th here. One by four and a half lengths. And you can see in this workout, again, that's why these workouts are so valuable. You can see Mr. Chivas is more than holding his own with a very impressive first-time starter winner by the name of Going Mobile. Eventually, he'll start to lose ground as they approach the far turn. But nevertheless, the fact he could show speed and he's going to get Edwin Maldonado in the saddle today, I think speaks volumes in terms of what the tactics will be for Mr. Chivas. I think he's going to break from the gate and take them as long as he possibly can. He does fall back here, but nevertheless, keep in mind, Going Mobile, a very 
talent, 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 excuse me, talented baby for Terry Lovinger. The last uh, workout we're going to watch is She's My Niece on the Outside. She's a filly now running against Midnight Fury. Midnight Fury is a very nice horse. He's a three-year-old who finished third in his last effort in a maiden $200,000 claiming race back on February 11th, also from the Doug O'Neill barn. You'll notice all three of these workouts we're, we're showing are from the gate. And again, She's My Niece, in my opinion, very, very uh, precocious here, a daughter of hard spun. The foal, um, it's, this is her first foal, at least that I could find on DRF Formulator, but the dam fin did finish second in her debut at Aqueduct in a maiden special weight in her debut race. So th again, there's a bit of precocity here, but just let your eyes do the talking. And you can see she's my niece more than holding her own with a three-year-old uh, runner by the name of Midnight Philly, also from the Doug O'Neill Bar. Now we looked at a lot of video there, John. You look more at statistical information from a sire standpoint and maybe Maybe even from a dam standpoint, how do you kind of analyze race number three? Because as I mentioned in the opening, these type of main races can be very intimidating for most horse players. Well, to pick up on your Spokem, um, Spokem EZ, um, one of the maiden winners uh, by that mare uh, was EZ Ferris, who won at four and a half about a year ago with uh, Walter Solis. And AP Indy, the broodmare sire, has um, produced... 127 first time winners. Wow. So a lot a lot of good in-depth stats there on Smoke em Easy. Plus the the last work was 47-1, the best of any of these five out of the gate. So so they did push the horse a little bit harder on the on the last gate coming into the race. So, but that's my B pick. Now I went real deep on the A pick and that would be Midnight Love. And I know why you like them. But do tell us. <laughs> <laughs> At least I think I do. Okay. The mayor, Magical Band, um, produced a first-time winner called Magic at Midnight. This is Midnight Love's full sister. Same sire, same damn. And Magic at Midnight won her first race at Losal by 10 lengths. Magic at Midnight had five starts and four wins. And the trainer of Magic at Midnight was Hector Palma today's trainer of Midnight Love. So that also Spot Dioro has a mare, Magic Spot, who's one of its first time winners was Prince Hussar and at five and a half. And Tiago was on Prince Hussar when that horse won its first race. So Tiago's on Midnight Love and with all the connections with Magic at Midnight, Hector, um, I really like the one as the A pick. One and three to kick off the 20 cent rainbow pick six. A very interesting and fascinating uh, baby race if you do the research and kind of dig a little bit deeper, as both John and I have done. Race number four begins the 50 cent late pick five. We're on the turf course, one mile of the distance, $25,000 of the claiming tag. We've got a field of six and the, and the morning line favorite down on the rail number one, Ouija from the Jeff Mullins barn. One of two in here trained by Jeff Mullins. Give us your thoughts on race four, John. Originally, Ouija was going to be the A pick because. Three back, Ouija blew by Spirit Maker by two and a half. And then if you go up to Rip City, Spirit Maker blew by um, Rip City uh, in this last race on April 20, 28th. However, I also get the digest for workouts. And the the today's race and digest and their report on Ouija's last work Looked very average getting five panels at 103.6 over the training track while appearing weary in the final stages. Not a good endorsement for Ouija. So I went to Rip City because of the speed of Rip City, because Rip City did a 133.3 at a mile back in uh, last November. And then the other horse, the second horse, would be Camaraderie. And if you look at Camaraderie's last race, November 24th, was just missed to overdue. But the third horse was Opry. And Opry is in italics, which means it's won its next race. And Opry beat a horse named Dean Martini, who just won last weekend. For trainer Peter Erton. And, these, and hit, so Camaraderie has very solid works coming in. So... Rip City on the on the lead and camaraderie to 
track and perhaps prounce. Four and six in race number four. Let's take a look at race number five, another maiden race. This one is a maiden claiming race for fillies and mares. $20,000 is the claiming tag. Tra traveling a mile and a 16th on the main track. Also race five begins the 50 cent late pick four. We've got a field of five, number five. Rosie Edge from the Leonard Powell Barn is the six to five Maury line favorite. First time around two turns. What say you about race five, John? Not one of my favorite angles. From five and a half to a mile and a 16th, I don't see any foundation works. That's asking a lot of her, isn't a it? A lot, and it's six to five, so I'm going to pass on Rosie Edge. Um, Midnight Silence, a f one of the two four-year-old fillies in this race with three three-year-old fillies, um, just um, was second to Hot Rod Mama, and so I like that that it's had his experience. Now they're going to go a mile, a, a sixteenth longer. And then Jacqueline uh, uh, Cochran, the four, is the second choice. Now, it says in the form, it says no bid, but I watched the race, and Jacqueline Cochran was closing on Midnight Silence. So three and four. Fair enough. Before we take a look at race number six, John, a question for you, which is an interesting one, because we're old enough to remember when maidens that were three-year-olds at this time of year never ran against older. Now they do, and you've alluded to it in race number five. We have two four-year-olds competing against older. I think historically we've always thought that those older runners would have an edge, but if you go back and look the last couple of years, lo and behold, some of the three-year-olds are beating the older in these races where we're combining all the age groups of the maidens. What say you about that kind of quirk in terms of the uh, change in our condition book? I think you're right on because there's less entries in the in the in the race. But if if you have a one three year old against all four year olds in an eight horse race, then you have a tendency to I would have a tendency to throw that horse out. Fair enough. Let's take but a look. Later in the year, the three year old three year olds things change. Yeah, yeah, things change. Yeah. Later in the year would be basically around the time of Labor Day or maybe September, a little bit before yeah, then. Exactly September, right. Yeah. Race number six, we're back on the turf course. And again, this is a maiden special weight race for Calbreds going one mile. Scratch the four leaves us with a feel of six. The morning line favorite, the invader from Gulfstream Park, who was claimed by Bob Hess, I believe, because uh, he was a Calbred, is number three, silver and black, five to two on the morning line. Hess to Sormo tandem have won quite a few races that we were call over the years are they going to win race six john perhaps um silver and black is everyone the best bet but with brad free the best bet with uh bob mazursky um this was a ship and wind probably yeah, kind of is. kind of horse it is um had problems boxed far turned bumped the Sormo's only mount of the day um and this horse was entered in another race a couple weeks back but was scratched uh, so the, the horse is definitely probably over ready. However, um, that's the A pick, but there is a horse number six, get the gold in which I went deep again on, on the breeding, the sire passion for gold ran in great Britain passion for gold won its first race at a mile on a turf passion for gold had seven starts, three wins, all roots. And then, uh, the mayor, uh, uh, Hondo's Way, produced a first-time winner called Get the Prize, and Get the Prize um, won its first race, nine starts, and three wins. So, and Bravo is so good about taking these um, measured first starts on the grass and then stretching out on the on the second or third uh, go round. So, Get the Gold is right behind. Um, uh, the, the three horse get the gold broke from the rail last time out which can always be problematic for a first time starter also <clears throat> let me ask you a question john Kristen mulhall at least in the racing form with limited statistics does well sprint to route does that factor into your handicapping equation as well not so much i the the breeding i mean i go back to 70 percent 70 percent the horse 15 percent trainer 15 percent jockey in my in my view that's my view but Kristen uh, is such a measured conservative great trainer she's going to do right by the horse she you know some trainers might have done two sprints but she feels comfortable enough putting this horse on the route so and and bravo just knows how to measure a horse on around the track you said jockeys are 15 percent, but it sounds like bravo might be one of your favorites it, in this situation well, right you, you have to be elastic with your reasoning all the time right in certain situations i've seen him do this with a papa Dr Padromo so many times we're held on the first time he takes a horse around the ground he just knows how to bring him home 
And it's an educational run. He learns something from it and applies it in the second right. start. He's one of the smartest jocks out there. <laughs> Race number seven begins the $1 Golden Hour Pick 4, linking our last two races here with the last two races at Golden Gate. It always pays well because it's a higher minimum, $1, with a lower takeout. And we kick things off in the dollar Golden Hour Pick 4 in Race 7, going seven furlongs in the main track for three-year-old fillies, allowance optional claiming types, a field of six. Number three, doing it the hard way, who didn't run very well at Sunland Park, ships back to Southern California for trainer Bob Baffert and is a seven-to-five morning line favorite. We've talked a lot about how you like seven furlong races, John. This is your specialty. Who do you like and why? Okay, first, can I hold that off for a second? I want to. We got nine minutes. Take your time. Okay. Oh, okay, good. So, the book is a re in depth research over 12 years on the number of um, winners of certain sires at seven furlongs. Why seven furlongs? Because it's such a bastard distance. Um, is it's a, a short route or a long sprint, and it's in between. And if you talk to Jimmy, uh, the hat about, he says, if a horse can do seven, it can do anything. So it's such a critical, pivotal distance. So in my research over the last 12 years, uh, what I'm going to do is give you the number of winners by the sire of the horses in today's race. Fire away. Start with Blessed Touch, who's sired by Gervin, who's a relatively new sire. One winner out of seven. Okay, seven, one for seven. Get uh, the money sired by Midnight Loot. It's got to be a bigger num number. 49. 49 winners. 49 winners. Wow. Number three, doing it the hard way, Street Sense. 82. 82. Number four, Liberal Lady, More Spirit. Zero. Number five, In Color, Street Sense. 82. And number six, Gila from Mohamed. Four. So basically what you're telling me is at least preliminarily, you're kind of focused on either two or three. No. <laughs> not, <laughs> not at all. Okay. One and two. All right. Tell us why one. Okay. Um, Blessed touched um, two back February 19th was coming down the stretch on a six furlongs and then checked real hard. And uh, Vasquez uh, made a jockey uh, claim a foul and was denied. And, but the horse kept coming and I really, and it's also raced competitively against Faza. So this is a very strong, very good horse. Um, and is my B pick, but the A pick is get the money and beat, uh, do it the hard way by five and a half at Del Mar. And that's very impressive and speed and just kept going. So it comes back on his first, uh, first race off the layoff and off slow, which was very disconcerting because the last work before being off slow was a bullet 59 March 20th before the March 27th race. So what do they, what does Brian do? He puts on blinkers to make sure he comes out focused out of the gate. And I see blessed touch and, and we'll get the money as a and blessed touch as B two and one in race number seven. Before we take a look at race number eight, uh, John, a quick promotion for your book, which is seven furlong sire rankings. If you're not on Twitter, you should be. And here's the reason why the first five people who direct message me at Quigley's underscore corner, courtesy of John are going to get a free copy. That's right. A free copy of the seven furlong sire rankings. So fire up your Twitter account, direct message me at, at Quigley's underscore corner. And you'll basically, get this book absolutely free of charge all you got to do is give me your name and mailing address the first five people to direct message me on twitter courtesy of john bowl will get a free copy of seven furlong sire rankings you'll find it very interesting and you'll be able to take advantage of john's tireless work over the last 10 years we close things out in race number eight which begins the five dollar golden hour daily double linking our last race here with the last race at golden gate and we're sprinting six snap furlongs on the flat turf course again this is a maiden claiming race for fillies and mares fifty thousand dollars is the claiming tag we've got a few Field of eight, number three, Ava Storm is the first is the uh, morning line favorite at five to two. Career start number two. But before we get your thoughts on the race, John, we want to watch the replay for three of these runners. It was back on April twenty first. It was the ninth race, and specifically the three runners in this race in race number nine that exit that race are number one, Bella Baby, number four, my girl, my gals Dawn and Lori, and number five, Miss Joni. Now take note that both numbers number one, Bella Baby, and my gals Dawn and Lori break from the two outside posts. Those are the two runners I want you to pay the most attention to runners seven and eight in this replay back on april 21st let's listen to frank miramati describe the action and they're off even start Bella Baby, California Bling up close in the early going. And here's Dialing Scotty now sprinting up to take the lead. And Dialing Scotty makes the lead 
very comfortably. My gals, Don and Lori on the outside, take second, followed by Bella Baby in third. They're followed by Miss Joni and then Miss Lizzie racing in fifth, five or six lengths off the pacemaker. Whirly Gurley is next on the outside of California Bling and Map to My Heart at the back of the field. It's dialing Scotty in control around the far turn, cruising with a two-length lead. My gals Don and Lori now cuts into the margin second, followed by Miss Joni and Bella Baby right together third and fourth, and then Miss Lizzie fifth, just waiting for room, angling to the outside now with four lengths to make up. They're at the top of the stretch, dialing Scotty, confronted and passed by my gals Don and Lori on the extreme outside. Here comes Miss Lizzie now, and in between them, Bella Baby. It's a driving finish. Miss Lizzie with solid momentum on the outside, coming to get it all. And it will be Miss Lizzie, another for Reese Bully, winning it going away. My gals Don and Lori was second. Then it was oh, Bella, Bella Baby. Baby. John, look at the gallop up for number four, my gals Don and Lori on that replay right there. Certainly she wanted to uh, cover more ground. She's not going to get any more ground today, but she got beat by Miss Lizzie, who was well meant that day. And number one, Bella Baby, if you look in the racing form, it didn't look like she showed that much speed in the racing form, but you can see she broke well, shuffled back, and it was a good effort for start number one. She didn't change leads. Now trainer Peter Miller puts the blinkers on. A couple of content, con uh, main contenders, I should say, in race number eight. Number one, Bella Baby, and number four, my gals Don and Lori. How do you see the night? Yeah. Uh, Bella Baby was impressive and with blinkers on and with uh, Peter Miller, he wins at a 26% strike rate on second asking. So, and Hernandez uh, does really well with, when blinkers go on a horse. I don't know. I, I don't have any research on it, but he does really well. So that's my B pick, but the A pick is Ava Storm. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I watched Ava Storm. Getting all choked up, though. Because <laughs> watched... it's the last race. We want more racing. <laughs> Getting... oh, uh, so I watched the last race, February 20th, with Ava Storm in the 11 post at a six furlong turf. This horse was just couldn't wait to get out of the gate and just kept drifting over, 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 get bumped a few, bumped a few, and got to the lead and just um, kind of tired out, uh, lost to real fire at the end. The mayor... Ava G has uh, threw a first time starter called My Miss Rose, who was two for two. And uh, being in the three hole instead of the 11 hole, I just think Ava Storm is going to be really hard to beat. But Bella Baby um, will be up there. And then uh, the four as well. The in most interesting horse I want to really take a keen eye on is the seven Signora Minister with a two year layoff. Um, uh, should be really interesting to see, but I do like the long works on Signora Minister with two six for long works. So this, I really want to see what happens here. But Miller on the on the turf in the in in sprints, you got to watch everything he throws out there. Three and one to wrap it up. As you can, as you can tell over the last forty minutes or so, you can tell that John Ball, our seminar guest, is an absolute student of the game. He does the research, and you'll be the benefactor of it. If you direct message me on Twitter and send me your name and address, you'll get a free copy of Seven Furlong Sire Ratings. If you're one of the first five uh, viewers to direct message me on Twitter at Quigley's underscore uh, Corner. John, thanks so much for your time and insight today. Always a pleasure seeing you at the track. You still playing baseball? Uh, no, I'm not playing baseball. I'm starting to write scripts again, uh, so I'm trying to get back into business. Well, we'll see you at the track in between your writing scripts. We'll see you at the track not only today, but also tomorrow and Sunday. We've got a nine race card tomorrow and an eight race card Saturday. Next voice you hear will be track announcer Frank Miramati updating us with any late program changes. Thanks for watching, everybody. Have fun and good luck. Ladies and gentlemen, please rise for our national anthem.
Good afternoon and welcome to Santa Anita Park. The track is fast, the turf firm. Rail on the turf is 30 feet. Here are the changes. In the first with a super high five carryover from last week of $11,963. Number one, Adventuresome carries two pounds over. And scratch number eight, Maltese Falcon. The first starts the early pick five. We have a blinker note in race number two listed on the bottom of your program page. Overweights in the third, one plus two, two plus three, five plus three. The third starts the rainbow six jackpot with 58,000 in the carryover. In the fourth, start of the late pick five, there are no changes. In the fifth, numbers one and two each carry three pounds over. In the sixth, no high five with the scratch of number four, Montana. Note that number three, silver and black, is two pounds over. Seven starts the golden hour pick four with just a blinkered out. Eight starts the golden hour double. Number two, turquoise bikini, three pounds over. Enjoy your day at the great race place. Post time for the first is in 26 minutes at 1 p.m.